Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nicholas Walsh from sportswebinars.com. I'm joined on the line by the great Paddy Butler, the former National Hurling Coordinator. Uh, I was just having a bit of a laugh with Paddy online before. We were just saying that we now can come live from behind the computer screen uh, whilst it's uh, nearly minus one on the ground outside and we don't have to go to the hurling pitch anymore. Uh, but look, this is only one way. It's uh, an innovative way that we're trying to learn. Uh, the GA are pushing hard the online learning stream and this is just one of the many strands that they're trying to do. Uh, once again, thanks for everyone for attending uh, this morning and thanks for the positive feedback we, we received in terms of Jason Ryan's webinar on Wednesday evening. I know Jimmy Darcy and Crow Park and ourselves on sports webinars on, via Twitter and via email got um, an outstanding amount of um, feedback back and thanks for those who filled in the survey as well. I should mention after we, we finish the um, webinar th this morning with Pody, uh, you'll, you'll receive an email about an hour after and there will be a survey attached to it. There'll be five simple questions. If you can just click on the link and answer the questions, they're mainly a scale of one to five and then you've got some comments if you wish to contribute to the online uh, survey that we're trying to achieve. Uh, before I hand you over to Paddy, just let me mention that we um, we are obviously live and if you're streaming or downloading anything uh, at home at the moment, um, for example movies or music, that may have an interference with the coverage that you're receiving for the webinar. Uh, also, uh, the webinar during the webinar you can pop a question into the question box down the bottom if, if Paddy stimulates the mind at some stage and you have a question pop it in the box, I'll moderate the question and then I'll hold it off till the end and we'll ask uh, Paddy a variety of questions when he finishes his uh, topic. Um, again, we're recording this webinar and you'll receive a copy from Jimmy Darcy and all of the learning um, from GA headquarters at Crow Park. So, Paddy, I'll hand it over to yourself. Uh, welcome. And thank you, Nicholas. Steve Accorda, and good morning to everybody from a frosty Tipperary. This morning we're talking about a new approach to uh, presenting hurling to children, uh, building an open structure for a child-centered participation in hurling. We'll be dealing with the what's and the how, and particularly the why of, of this approach. We start with an open mind, and we now know that the traditional ways of teaching hurling haven't succeeded in spreading it and we haven't um, fulfilled our national desire to increase participation and to improve skills. So a new approach was wanted. So we take our lead now from Stephen Covey in the seven habits of highly effective people. We'll begin with the end in mind and with this picture you already see on your screen you see the beautiful swan, natural, elegant, moving beautifully, effortless to us, appearing effortless, but of course there's effort. But she's in full flow and she looks great. So this is the end we have in mind for our children, that by the age of 12, they begin to look graceful and balanced and economical in their movements and in the performance of the skills. And an awful lot of that will depend on the environment that we can create. Um, this uh, great bird is in element in the air and on the water. We're hoping that our children will be in their element in the classroom and on the field and wherever they are, well-balanced children who have a full life and who get joy and excitement out of playing Gaelic games. On the other hand, we have the capability of being destructive. Here you see um, a bush on the west coast of Ireland. The winds are harsh and severe and this bush is in survival mode. Now survival mode is grand for survival but it's not great when we want to be creative and exciting on a playing field. The bush is deformed, lopsided and stunted because of the conditions on which it, uh, the prevailing winds uh, are constant day and night, year in, year out. We have to give the bush credit, it has survived. But we don't want children to have to be in that mode. We don't want children to go into survival mode. You know from the hedgehog, when he's threatened, going into survival mode, 
wraps in his legs and his head and all his soft underparts and sticks out his spines. And he cannot function, he cannot live, he cannot develop or feed himself in that mode until the danger threatens. The same with the turtle. They pull in their limbs and their head and they clamp up completely. But it's survival mode. There's no joy in that, it's just survival. So in the old way, a lot of children just survived that, and hurling survived in the tradition, traditional areas. We want to go forward now with new confidence. We want all our children, all the children of Ireland and children all over the world, able to enjoy Gaelic games, able to enjoy their hurling and develop themselves through hurling in their community. So long before the swan gets up in the air and looks so comfortable, they must get their feet under them. And if you live by a waterway, in April and May, you may hear a tremendous clatter down on, on, on the river. Here these birds are trying to get airborne, copy their parents, copy the adults. And if they get airborne for five meters or five seconds, then that's a great success that day. And they will rest their wings for another day. Just as the Wright brothers discovered uh, airplane flight by a flight of seven or eight seconds, that was enough to excite them and open the possibility. So if we can give children little successes early on, then that will inspire them to drive on and find the potential in themselves. So our aim at a national level is that by the age of 12, all children will be bilateral, have acquired bilateral coordination striking on the right and the left, at will, at ease, as the ball and as the play demands. Fully uh, developed within themselves, within their own potential, we know that every child has this potential and we know that our onerous task is to create the environment which that talent can develop and get into a state of flow. And children who have hours and hours of spare time will be inspired to hone those skills and practice on their own because of the enjoyment that they get from it. Here in this uh, beautiful natural setting, I want to bring two big ideas to you. The idea of what self-consciousness does or doesn't allow and what self-awareness will allow. So the picture here, the lake is so calm, it's a perfect reflection of the reality. The trees in the water are not trees, they're not real. They're a reflection of reality. So when I, the coach, I'm in self-awareness. When I'm fully aware, I know then the language I'm using, the tasks I'm setting. But my mind is calm and it's reflecting the state of the children are in. So I'll be, I'll be useful to them. I'll be helpful to them in the state that they're in, in the age that they're in, and the amount of experience they have. Self-consciousness on my part will cripple all the children. So self-conscious is a crippling state of mind. I am not uh, on task. I'm not there for the children. It's the opposite of child-centered. And I then become the destroyer of children, the destroyer of their happiness, and the destroyer of their development and their growth. And I cannot allow them to get into the state of flow. Self-awareness then, in the children and myself, is we know we're going to mistakes. We know we're going to do things wrong. We know things won't always happen, we'll miss the ball, we'll miss the score, and that's okay. Just as the swans couldn't take to the air the day they were born, and it took a long, slow process over the summer for them to get airborne, and just as me and you, when we were small children, between the ages of six months and 18 months, we might have fallen a million times. But because we weren't under the spotlight, or we weren't self-conscious, we knew perfectly well that that was a normal process that then I fall and I get up and I'm better tomorrow. I might hold on to the chair, I might hold on to mammy's hand, I might hold on to the railing or the radiator, whatever assistance I might take it. But my drive is to walk on my own and I know that there's a million falls required for that. So in the training field, children will be making mistakes and coaches will make mistakes. We'll develop things that are inappropriate, that are too advanced, and then we have to rewind. And there's no harm at all for a coach to say, sorry children, we'll have to go back on that one. 
So self-awareness is where we're going to leave self-consciousness behind us. We know our purpose is good. We know our motivation is good. So you see now in this uh, picture, the children are now the swans and they're in full flow. They're 12 years of age or 11 years of age. And Sally Goddard Blythe is the author of this, The Well-Balanced Child. So when I was a principal of, of the school over in Inch, our purpose in school was to send out well-balanced children after sixth class onto the secondary schools, balanced in the full dimensions of their humanity, in emotional, psychological, physical, aesthetic, imaginative, moral, and psychological uh, needs of the full human being. So the child who is well balanced can play Gaelic games to a high level. They can hurl to satisfy themselves. They can make a contribution to their community. They can be central to their community and they can have the full life. And as they go on then in later stages, they're fully equipped to develop themselves to a higher level. But long before the child speaks Gaelic or English, movement is the child's first language. And when we go to the field or go to the hall, or go to the yard, we must ensure that there's plenty of movement. Less talking from the coach and more movement from the children. They need to express themselves. And through expressing themselves, they grow in all the dimensions of the human being. And through that, they get self-acceptance and their self-esteem builds and they become very valuable people in society. We're going now to build our dynasty and build our castle and we take care that we start in the foundation. The foundation of the house or the foundation of the building is of crucial importance. You will have seen as you drive along castles that have split in two and one part is standing and the other part is long gone because the foundation on one half wasn't a solid and wasn't on the solid rock and it collapsed. And if we're going to be building our future and doing our duty according to the child, we will build in a solid foundation. A modern foundation is made of concrete and steel. So if we look at high level sport, whether it be the All-Ireland Hurling Final or Football Final or a minor final or a soccer match or a rugby match, we see that the, the base of the whole thing is agility. The player's ability to move forward and backward, to move left and right and to move diagonally as the play demands seems to be a fundamental of the whole thing. And without this agility, children can develop a low self-esteem because they haven't got the tools, the physical tools to play the game. Balance, on the other hand, is more difficult and, and complex com uh, thing. It, it, it belongs in the inner ear. And so the traditional definition of balance was good on your feet. Good on your feet is agility the ability to move well. Balance is what we do when we're off our feet, how we manage when we go for a high ball. How can I get a 10-year-old child to leave the ground and trust it, to, to make a dive, to save a goal, to make a dive, to tap in or to pull on a high ball. Balance is what we do off our feet. It can only be developed by um, trampolines, bouncing castles, um, handstands, um, turning over in a swimming pool, all these mechanisms that get the body to turn and twist and turn when it's in the air. So balance, a vital ingredient, we won't see it until it is there. And the more children roll when they're small, rolling on the ground, rolling on sand dunes, uh, cartwheels, head over heels, all that kind of thing develops balance in the child. And once upon a time in a natural setting, everybody would do that. Now in our more urban settings, that mightn't be as obvious. Coordination then is when all the limbs combine with the eyes and the brain to achieve an agreed outcome. Hurling is probably the greatest developer of coordination. So we could develop coordination through the game. If we had the agility and the balance, the coordination can be developed through the game. The hurley in one hand and the bean bag catching in the other hand, putting it onto the hurley, moving, receiving from a friend, all these things develop. The good left hand for catching or the good right hand for holding if you're right-handed and the opposite if you're left-handed. 90% of Irish children 
uh, are right-handed and 10% are left-handed. The J.J. Delaney types are left-handed. They need a hurley in the left hand. So if we give the child a small little hurley, very manageable, 12 or 14 inches long, they will automatically take it in their writing hand. And so good practice from the very beginning rather than correction later on. The walls of our house are running and jumping and throwing. Um, once upon a time, or maybe still, in places like Kenya, those running would be a natural way of getting from place to place. It isn't the natural way anymore. Cars have taken over, so children's running mechanism may not be developed. Their ability to jump, their ability to jump off one foot and two foot, their ability to land carefully. We see even at the highest level people um, breaking their knees, coming down on one foot, and throwing. So throwing is the precursor to the hand pass, and every child should be familiar with the underarm throw long, long before we ever introduce the hand pass. I'd be very slow to introduce the hand pass before nine years of age, because the throwing mechanism needs to be there first. And then put on the roof of the house, the catching and the passing, uh, kicking and striking. These are the roof of the house. And you know so many clubs and places start off the child at the roof stage and haven't, haven't done right by the child in building up the necessary tools to get to there. And of course, once the child can catch and pass and kick and strike, the enjoyment is fantastic. In order to do that, the house, this would be a very bare shed. The house needs a door, and the games is the door to the child's heart. Can I devise a game to develop agility? Can I devise a game to uh, develop coordination or to develop passing or to develop striking? Then that becomes my chore as a coach. In my quiet time, I'm planning and plotting. I think there's a game for this. I must devise a game for that. And the GA provides lots of support in that. But openness and transparency are crucial. Fun is the windows letting in the light. When we're talking to our children and training our children, we would want all the parents and everybody in the parish to hear what we're saying and to know exactly the content of our speech. We're talking to children from a position of respect and equality. So fun is accountability, um, it's light, it's openness, it's transparency. Now all this house would be very cold and uninhabitable unless the coach brings the atmosphere. So the coach is the fire, the coach is the heating system that creates the atmosphere to attract children to the field or to the hall in the winter time or to the astroturf wherever the game is played. Now if we're going to put um, the child at the center of the whole thing, then we need tools for this. So Barney is the child and our tools are the how to code skills, to build rapport, to observe, analyze, explain, get feedback, provide demonstration, and tailor the task to Barney's needs, guaranteeing all the time that fun and learning are going on, because there is no real fun unless there's learning, and there's no learning unless there's fun. So why do we want to build rapport? Well, we'll just take a look now at what Anthony Robbins says what rapport is. Rapport is the ability to move fully from my map of the world to the other person's map of the world. Rapport is the ability to form a powerful common bond and a relationship of responsiveness. So rapport is me getting into Barney's shoes and taking the world from his perspective and what he'd like to do now and what he needs to do now. My, my reason to observe is to see what stage Barney is at, what has he done, learned since last week, and what's the new challenge required, how is his body language telling me the story of what is in his head. And I analyze what stage he is so that I can design a new game with a different emphasis. My language must be tailored to Barney, whether he's four or five or ten, the language must be clear. Then I must respect his uh, intelligence and his experience by asking questions. And I must provide demos, whether I'm able to do it myself or get somebody else. 
Now, if we go back on those again and we take a traditional way, the building rapport was unheard of, so you do what I say. You don't do what I do, but you do what I say because I'm the boss and I say so. I observe you with a view to finding out how many faults you have, and I remind you every moment of how bad you are at everything. The only reason I analyze is to make the next task so difficult that you won't be able to do it, and I'll be the only one in the whole place who'll know anything. My language might be adult, it might be too loud, so I'm saying you're deaf by shouting at you. I say it 50 times to convince you that you're stupid. So the traditional way is, haven't really succeeded. And it is time for change, and, we, and there is change, and it's a time of change. And children are being taught in a new way in primary schools, and they are being treated differently. Because maybe another big change is that these young children didn't come to our clubs. They didn't come until they were later. So now we have to adjust our world to Barney, because Barney is the real child. And if we want to increase participation, then every child is Barney. And in rural places, we need everybody. And in the urban areas, I think in fairness to the children, they are entitled to play hurling as well. So Barney has two worlds, his quality world, where he only allows in five or six, at max seven people. And then he has the trash bin, where all the others must go. They're a pain in the neck for Barney. So into his quality world, he allows some people. You mightn't think that Barney knows so much, but even by the age of seven, Barney knows all this. And these are the conditions that Barney sets to allow people into his quality world. So, keep my promises. So the promises that I make must be keepable. I mustn't promise things that I cannot deliver. So if I promise um, Barney that he'll be good at soloing in 12 months, or that he'll be able to strike the ball, over the bar from the 21-yard line in two years, well then, that's achievable. I call Barney by his name, not by any other name. I won't call him you, or you over there, or you with the yellow helmet, or you with the black boots. I'll call him Barney. And if I call him Barney, I have a great chance that I'm into his quality world. And if I'm into his quality world, well then, we have rapport. I acknowledge his efforts. He may only catch one ball in three, he may miss one ball in two, but that's okay. He made the effort. I'll be kind because he's young. He needs kindness around him. I'll be good-humored. I'll be respectful because he's my equal in every way as a human being. I'll do my best to be fair. I'll be self-aware, and I'll be aware that bullying does go on and that I must be vigilant about it. I will teach him skills in an organized way, according as his age, and his state of development. I guarantee him a game every single day, and I accept that in the process, he'll make mistakes. Now, if I can do that, Barney puts me into his quality world, and then Barney will be hurling and playing Gaelic games for all the rest of his life. And later, when he retires, he will become a coach or an administrator, and he will make a further contribution. So Barney uh, can explain to me everything that I need to know to be a great coach. So as we go along now, I have a few questions for you. Can you remember what the foundation was? What goes into the foundation? Can you remember the words, the ABCs? Okay, you got those. Can you remember the walls? The RJTs. Yep, the running and the jumping and the throwing. And what was the roof? The roof was blue. CPKS, yes, you got them the catching, the passing, the kicking, and the striking. And of course, the key to the whole thing is the games. And then, the openness and the transparency, letting in the light. And can you, with your tremendous dedication and your passion for the, for the game, can you create the environment that will attract the children into our games? Our national policy, then, um, you see from this lovely picture of the quick touch ball, it would be attractive to any 12-year-old. Can we, as an association, be child-centered and games-based? Child-centered, everything is tailored around the child. 
There's the age of development and it's game based. It isn't an adult game based, the 15 aside, that isn't um, child centred. The child might only get one touch of the ball in a half an hour. They might get no touch of the ball in a half an hour. Child centred is the game is designed around the child's needs. Sometimes it's a one aside game, one versus one. Sometimes it's 2v2 or 3v2 or 3v1 or 5v5. But the more, the better we design the game. If I have 20 children in the field and I make two for five sides, or I make 10 teams of two for a purpose, then I'm guaranteeing the child is going to get plenty of touches of the ball. We might finish up with 10v10, but in the meantime, the child has got plenty of ball practice. The equipment and everything else is geared around the child. So here's the swan, graceful, balanced, economical. This is the child we want. Now we come back to the, the, the passion and the desire in the coach that's required. Passion in itself can be destructive or can be magnificent and create swans. But when passion is coupled to principles, it guarantees this kind of thing. It guarantees the children will be in flow. Without the principled uh, approach, the passion can go astray. And again, the persistency that's required to stay with the child over the duration for the four or five or six or eight years it takes. When that's coupled with person personableness, then the child is in a warm and friendly atmosphere and we avoid destruction that was sometimes common in the past. So passion could do this too. When we, when we couple it to principle, then we're into self-awareness, we're into the good of the child, we're into the openness and accountability. So this is what happens when we need to win. When my ego needs to win, then the child is just a tool. He's no longer a person, no longer my equal, no longer intelligent, no longer an emotional entity. Winning at all costs, at all costs distorts everything. Every ball then must be struck on the strong side. There's no time for experimentation. There's no time for development. We just go down a narrow tube. And that's okay for a few. A few can survive that. But for everybody else, they go into survival mode. And then in their teenage years, they drift away. So we have, you know, we've learned harsh lessons from the past. That uh, winning at all costs is utterly destructive of human beings. And uh, there are many counties playing hurling, many clubs playing hurling, who don't win all that much. And they've been playing hurling for as long as anybody remembers. Winning doesn't solve all problems. It's nice to win, but it isn't the object of, child, of the child section. So here we have age-appropriate equipment. On your left you have the bean bag which is a bit more stable than the ball. There's a small little hurley that they take in the dominant hand. You have the safety mats, which are the equivalent of agility poles and ladders and hurdles, all wrapped up in one in a safety environment, and then the beam ball as the child is advancing and need another challenge. With this, we can develop catching and passing. We can develop all the skills that we want. So here's a beautiful picture of children, second class children in a school. 100% engaged in full flow. You can read from their body language. The children that are on, totally engaged, are learning how to take the corner, learning how to manage their body. You can see emotionally they're happy with that. Psychologically they're happy. They're happy to have the little hurley in their hand. What's going on here is a thing we call accretion. The child is having a terrific time. The hurley is in his hand and the association is made. That I love hurling. That's the way the child mind works. I love this. I'm getting a great time. Now, if you like to observe the children that are not on, how completely into it they are. They're observing. They're waiting their turn. They know their turn is coming. There's trust. There's relaxation on their faces. Everybody is in. What are the coaches doing? Well, they're in mode. They're observing. I'm reminded of Emily Dick Dickinson's lovely poem. They might not need, need me, but they might. I let my, my head be just in sight. A smile as small, as small as mine can be. 
precisely their necessity. The children aren't going to be looking at me if they are. They aren't on the job. If I'm forcing them to look at me, I'm into self-consciousness. Self-awareness is all the children are fully engaged. They're fully happy. They don't need over instruction. They've got their instruction. They're intelligent. I don't need to shout. They're not deaf. I don't need to say it 50 times. They're not stupid. And all these old habits that we inherited. And down in the end, you can see the hurling wall, where in two years' time, they'll be fully able to enjoy themselves and express themselves in another way, in a more advanced state. But at the moment, they're getting their feet under them. That's emotional and psychological as much as it is physical. And of course it's physical. But we're setting the idea that, child, you are capable. You're immensely capable. Once you train your feet, you can do anything. Once you're having a happy time, your mind will grow. And your desire will grow. And, and, and your belief in yourself, your self-esteem will grow. So the coaches there are just in a supervisory mode with minimum instruction. The floor is safe. No child will run into any other child. So safety is, is a big issue here, but the, this is child-centered approach. All the children in the classroom are here. No child left in the classroom. Every single child is there. It doesn't matter about their academic ability now. They're all equal. The next level is they're learning to fly just as the swans or the Wright brothers got off the ground for five or seven seconds, these children are learning to fly. The environment is lovely. They have the mat floor, the roof over their head, and everything. They have the small hurley and the big ball, great chance of success. One thing that's sticking out, I suppose, in a child-friendly world is the helmet looks a bit harsh and a bit cumbersome, and a softer, maybe a softer and more uh, pliable material might be easier on the child. But nonetheless, the children here are having a really good time. They're in game mode. They're fully into it. There's no need to uh, instruct them. They have got their instruction, and they're now game on. And then, by 12 years of age or 11, we're flying. You hear, see this beautiful picture here? Children in full flight. The defender, respectful, well-organized, well-balanced, well-coordinated, coming alongside. And the attacker in full, in full flight, hell-bent on getting that score. There's no need to talk to those children about concentration. There's no need to shout at those. They're into the game, and they're well on their way. So a guide to designing games. This is Rafe Coster, and one of the great designers of computer games in the world. And this is, this is um, what he took as a guide to designing games that would sell for him. Fun from games arises out of mastery. Mastery of the body, mastery of the mind, mastery of the hurley, mastery of the slitter. And you see this girl down in Kerry, 11-year-old girl, totally into the game. That could be Henry Shefflin. That could be any player. She's fully into it. And you see the girl in pink? She's fully into it in a different way trying to work it out, how on earth can I get this ball into the air and get my hurley, get my hand back on the hurley and still strike it. The first girl is at a different stage in development. She's full of confidence. She's perfecting her technique. Her body is responding perfectly to what's needed. Her hand is rejoining the hurley. The mammies and daddies are looking on, admiring. The children are in game mode. Five minutes later than that, they're in full game. This is the stage of development. It arises out of comprehension because our brains are important. It's an act of solving puzzles that gives me in fun. So can three children score a goal on three children? Can three adults take on three backs? Can three adults take on two backs and score a goal? It's always solving the puzzle. But games learning is the drug. Now wouldn't it be one massive contribution to Ireland, just like Michael Cusick, gave the GA to Ireland, wouldn't it be a massive contribution if learning was the new drug in Ireland? And that everybody got involved in learning, coaches and players and parents, in learning a new way to rear our children through Gaelic games. So this is why children play. Uh, in a survey in the five continents, these are the reasons why children play. And this will be a great guide then to us. They play to have fun to test themselves physically, emotionally, psychologically. 
to feel worthy. It is, seems to be basic to human being to be worthy of love and to be worthy of um, belonging, to be to be worthy of wearing the jersey, to be worthy a worthy human being, to belong, to have influence, and to be free, free of cares and free of worries. And sometimes for some children to copy their heroes. And for some poor children, the field might be the place where where life is at its best. So this is a guideline to us. And then we know from Maureen Gaffrey's great study, if children are to grow and to develop to their full potential, they need positive feedback at ratio of five to one. So if we're overcorrecting, we're not in child mode, we're not child centered. We're in self-consciousness. We cripple them into their self-consciousness instead of in a state of flow. So thank you for being with me this morning. I hope you have enjoyed this. And thank to Nicholas in Australia for making all this possible and to Jimmy Darcy in Crow Park. Paddy, thanks very much. Uh, once again, I hadn't heard you present in a while, but fantastic. Love hearing from you. Love looking at your presentations and love the depth that you get into in terms of the knowledge that you have and, and the experience that you have right throughout. Uh, Paddy, I've got a few questions that have floated in. Um, yes, thank you. I've been banking them now. I'll ask them and then sure, we, I'll ask one at a time and then give you a chance to let the audience know. Um, as, a, as a coach that is starting out, how do you recognize a child that may be lopsided or stunted, as you put it? Yeah, this is where self-awareness comes in. Uh, if I can leave myself out of the picture completely and, and, and be there for the child, their body language will tell me everything. A child has body language the week they're born. So the child's body language will tell me if, if they're holding a shoulder in tight or a, a hand in tight to their body, they're telling me I'm under pressure or holding their head maybe sideways or on their shoulder. They're telling me they're under pressure of some sort that they don't fully understand. They don't know the task. And they're not sure if they'd be able to do it. And sometimes their legs would be crossed. And sometimes there'd be a little bit of tightness instead of an openness and a freedom. And sometimes then, if you could, and sometimes it's difficult through the helmet, but to see the little facial muscles, is the, is the, is the, is the face wizened up or is it open? And are the eyes open and, and nice and happy and, and watching you? So it's a body language thing because they don't have uh, the precision in language to tell you exactly where they are. And that's an adult concept. So it, it, it's self-awareness. It's us losing our self-consciousness so the child can lose their self-consciousness. It's a process. It, listen, it took me a long time to learn that as a teacher. We're with children every day. And the then children probably, are probably best for the, for the infant teachers. The infant well, children on are the, the best. On the flip side of that, then, how important is the body language from a coach whilst taking that actual coaching session? Yeah, it's absolutely crucial. They copy us. Um, they copy us in, in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, children, autistic adults and animals have, have, have acuity of sight. They pick up detail. So children pick up detail in us that we're unaware of. And they will see a tension in us long before we know we're tense. And they will see a happiness on us. And they will see joy on us. So they know when I go into the field whether I want to be there or not. Is this a chore? Or is this a delight? Mm. So if I love being with the children, they already have got that picture. They have a way of tapping into that. And they know the coaches. And you know yourself when you went to school. You knew, you knew the teachers that you had. If you went to secondary school and you had 10 teachers, you knew them in a fortnight. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So we have an, the children have an acuity for learning those things. Um, they'll only express it among children, of course. But they know when a coach is cross and a coach is happy and a coach is good humor. And it's all written on our faces, and they read it plainly. Very good point. Very good point. Um, another question that has come in: uh, Would you be in favour of? Uh, sorry, would you be in favour of a parent sending a child to gymnastics to develop balance and coordination further to help fast track a child's development? There's no doubt about it. A lot of things are helpful. Swimming is helpful. Gymnastics are helpful. Um, all the martial arts, every, all those things are helpful. But time is scarce. And in Barney's world, which I didn't show today, they're not capable of going to too many things. They're, there's an overstretch on, on some children now. They're going to too many things. They're only capable of taking in so many. They have crash and school and home 
and they have the club and they have granny and granddad and, and really beyond that they're not able for an awful lot more so sometimes people in, in, in the guise of being self-centered um, are over stretching children and they're going to too many different uh, clubs and they cannot cope and in theory of course all that's good so it's crucial now that we get that good program in in our club because the child really cannot cope with four clubs that in an adult concept would be necessary but the child isn't really able to cope with that emotionally or psychologically. Okay, very good. Uh, just a, a very quick question. Uh, uh, what's a typical length of time a child's based coaching session should last? Well, if you saw the little children in the yard there uh, with their little colored hurleys, 35 minutes would be their limit. Okay. That would be an active, um, an active session and get up a good heart rate and the cardiovascular is developed the um, emotion is developed, but after that, uh, you're you're nearly on a negative downward slope. You're nearly <coughs> you're nearly on loss after that. So sometimes um, coaches are stretching sessions out beyond the children's ability because the mammy brought them down and they have to stay for the hour, and the hour becomes the chore. Mm. A very few very few children under eight are able for the hour. And <coughs> you know, senior club hurling is an hour to get arrested half time so we're into adult concepts very quickly but it's our business and uh, the small junior infants might be capable of 20 minutes 15 20 minutes fifth and sixth class then they'll be able for you know all told they might be able to stretch it to the hour if it was well graded but it's our business uh, is doing damage okay um Cody, how long over a period of weeks or months uh, would you would you take a child uh, would you take children for uh, fundamentals of hurling before progressing them to playing games? Well, parents now you know want to want their children minded a lot more, and uh, a lot a lot of clubs are beginning to go through the winter season and take children for fundamentals in the spring, and try and go to the field then when it's April or May. So if you have facilities. And you have a trained person, certainly in the winter months, uh, and if you have a school club liaison person, then there's a harmony in all of this, and the child develops quite quickly without being forced or without being overstretched. So with good facilities, uh, the child certainly certainly wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be doing any harm by doing a winter program in fundamentals uh, with, with with children. So I mean the adults. When you go back out in the field and you go back out with your team in Australia, they'll be doing the fundamentals in a, in a kind of an adult way, won't they? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Paul, you've got one more question after coming in. Uh, should you try and change or correct the child's grip if they're holding a hurling correctly, but the club are coaching them the other grip? Yeah. Now, the, the, <clears throat> this is the vexed question, and of course, if, if it's child-centered. If we go back to being child-centered, we'll do the right thing by the child. The writing by the child is to increase his capacity for fun and learning and, and development. And of course, the, the hurley in the dominant hand is going to increase that capacity enormously. So regardless of what anybody says, that's the right thing to do. Now, um, if the child is caught in a vice between feuding adults, well then, it is a hopeless story. But if, if, if we always go back to the fundamental question, what is the best for the child? It's best for the child that the hurley fits him first of all or her and that is the right size and that it's in the dominant hand. If we did a good fundamentals program the problem wouldn't arise and this is where the torture happens for children. They were neglected when they were small and they get abused when they're older because they're corrected every other minute and being, you know, as adults we wouldn't put up with it. But the children have been overcorrected because there was neglect earlier on. So if we could get the hurley into the dominant hand when the child is not self-conscious, then the whole thing would happen. But correcting, I would, I'd correct the child at any age, but I do it with their consent and their goodwill. Very good. Paddy, look, thanks very much for your time this morning. Uh, thanks to everyone for attending the GEA Learning Webinar hosted by us here at Sports Webinars. Uh, everyone, Christmas and the New Year is a great time for learning and upskilling yourself in terms of personal development. Um, just after the New Year, the GEA Games Development Conference is on on Saturday, 10th of January, supporting coaches of youth players. All tutors have been noted by Jimmy Darcy that all tutors have been invited 
to the coach education forum which is happening on the Friday night, uh, the 9th of January. So I'm presuming Jimmy will be in touch with everyone in, in, in terms of that. Uh, recordings of both Jason Ryan's and Paudy's webinar will be posted online to ga uh, or sorry learning.gea.ie and it'll also be emailed out uh, to everyone via our YouTube link or our YouTube page that we have as well. Um, guys, follow us on Twitter. Um, follow the GA Learning on Twitter at GA Learning and also us at Sports Webinars. Uh, hopefully in the new year we'll be pushing a number of new uh, materials throughout so keep in touch and we'll be in touch in relation to our new content early in the new year. Just I want to wish everyone a happy Christmas um, unfortunately I won't make it home this Christmas we only get 10 days off so it's only a, a brief time period but look at happy Christmas to everyone and we wish everyone the best for 2015. Paulie thanks very much and we'll see you soon. Okay, Sloan.